afternoon. Um, artificial intelligence, or AI, is one of the most exciting and high promise technologies to develop in the last decade. But what could be its impact in Africa, a continent characterized by its young population, rapidly developing infrastructure and reputation as a region with a rich and dynamic innovation ecosystem? That's what we'll be exploring in this panel today. Um, so my name is Millie Zimata. I'm Head of Public Policy at the Open Data Institute in England. Um, and with me today is um, Shira Miner, co-founder of Data Science Africa, Kate Callot, um, Head of Emerging Areas at NVIDIA, and Ernest Morbaze, re Research Scientist at Sunbird AI. Um, so welcome to the panel. Um, and uh, Shira, I'll begin with you. Um, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself and the work that you've been doing with Data Science Africa? Okay, so as you said, my name is Shira. I teach electrical engineering in Nyeri, Kenya. That's in a very beautiful part of, of Africa. I would say, hazard to say the best part. Uh, and uh, I've been teaching engineering there for the last seven years. Before that, I was, I spent some time in, U in the UK, in Sheffield and the States studying a little bit more about uh, for my postgraduate degrees. But uh, so since we, I came back to Kenya, we, you, you said in the beginning how AI is such a transformative technology. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I came back home, I was really excited to relay this to my students. And there are a lot of like-minded individuals, including Ernest, who is also on this call, who had similar things going on. Uh, local communities uh, trying to disseminate uh, information about AI to students so that they could take it up and build interesting solutions. To pro because in Africa, you know, every, every society has problems. And when uh, you have this exciting new tool, AI, you really want to use it to solve your problems. So that's what data science is about. Data Science Africa is about. So it's an organization, a grassroots organization, I like to think, uh, that organizes capacity building events. We, we've had events in uh, seven countries, I think six countries all over Africa, East and West. We are hoping to go north and south as well. And what we do is we, we both teach and provide an, uh, a place where researchers can come and, and share what they're doing to, 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 to you know, tackle problems if it's in agriculture, uh, ecosystem monitoring, the environment, you know, infrastructure, all applying data science, artificial intelligence. And we like to think ourselves as doing things end to end. So here we are thinking about, uh, to do da good data science, good AI, you need data. Mm -hmm. So often you'll find a lot of the problems you're trying to tackle, the data is the first problem you face, you don't have it. So we end up having to build a lot of interesting data collection systems, sensor systems, deploying them in the wild, collecting data, then getting into the you know um, good stuff, algorithms, running them on uh, compute, et cetera, solving, trying to solve problems. And the most exciting part is the link with, with students in that they, they, they are really soaking up this, this tech. I wish I was a student right now myself. Uh, the kind of things I see them doing are amazing. You know, they, they, they're able to create circuits, collect data, do the analysis and deploy products. So that, that's what we're doing at Data Science Africa. And, uh, you know, it's a grassroots, it's a very flat, it's, uh, I'm, I'm, from my part of the country, we, we believe in a lot of egalitarian, you know, structures. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they, it's a very diffuse organization, uh, a lot of people contributing, and I feel feeling that they are equally empowered to, to, to contribute to the community and to provide so, solutions. So, yeah, that's Data Science Africa. And... Uh, yeah, that's uh, it's it's come to take up a very large part of my life, which I'm I'm happy about. So I think that's that's enough about me. Oh, you've made me very jealous, I have to say. <laughs> um, so um, I guess I mean you're you're talking about working with the students and the kind of problem solving together and it being very collaborative. Um, so may I ask what's what's timely about this moment? Either why do you think this has been able to take place now? Or why do you think this is something that we should be pushing forward now? What, 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 is it, what is it about this moment? I think it's just a confluence of a lot of things. You know, uh, we, I think right now, 
tech tech and technologies are, are more accessible. You know, you can be cut, doing cutting edge AI, you know, straight off without, a, the, the barriers are a bit lower. Electronics are also cheaper. And then mm -hmm. there's also, I know it's a bit of a cliche now, this democratization, but it gives us an opportunity to take uh, low cost electronics, uh, a little bit cheaper compute than was the case previously, allows, allows people to experiment with solutions and actually be doing really interesting things without a large barrier, both in terms of education and equipment. So if you, if you go and run your, your computers, you need to build a system which requires a huge server, you could rent one for a short amount of time. You know, you don't need to invest in the entire infrastructure. You can collect a lot of data based on a Raspberry Pi. You know, so it's a lot of those things have come together. And also, I believe there's a group of Africa. I mean, I, I'm, I'm talking now as an African. There's a lot of awareness about who we are and needing to do for self. So I think they, there's both uh, the technical things that are coming together, but also ideological. And I think that's that's why this this moment is very very important, and things that's are beginning brilliant. to come together. I mean that's that's brilliant. I think it's going to lead very well to um, the next person I'd like to bring in, which is Kate Kate Callot. Um, so Kate, you're head of emerging areas of te at, um, at technology company Nvidia. Um, so why don't you also tell us a bit about yourself and the work that you're doing? Sure. Um, so at NVIDIA is actually my second week in the role, so it's pretty new for me. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been <laughs> I've been in 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 um, in AI for over five years and in technology as a as a whole in in over eight years now. And um, I started my career and I focused most of my career around building ecosystems, building ecosystems around IoT products, then building ecosystems around AI products. And over the past year or so, I've started to look at how we could accelerate the AI ecosystem in Africa. So that's how I came across um, Shera, Ernest, and um, that's where I started to kind of focus my my um, my uh, my perception because I feel like Africa is um, is an untapped opportunity today. If you look at how the AI innovation is being driven across the world, um, in America or Americas, the region, um, you will find innovation being driven by major tech players, major tech companies, the like of Google, Facebook, Amazon, and, um, uh, and so on. If you look at um, Asia, and most particularly China, it's mostly driven out of government. So governments are creating funds, encouraging startups to um, build local and investing in those startups um, to build Chinese. If you look at um, Europe, it's mostly driven by the individuals. By individuals, I mean everything that's data privacy and security so with um, with laws like GDPR, for example. But Africa is pretty interesting because Africa is actually um, driven by startups and communities. It's a bottom-up um, innovation, and um, it's all grassroots organizations like Data Science Africa, Deep Learning in Dabam communities of data scientists like Zindi, who are actually at the forefront of driving the innovation in Africa. Um, so it's, I've been completely, um, it's been completely incredible and I've been completely passionate around how do we accelerate this ecosystem and how we make sure that um, we work with these grassroots organizations, these communities to be able to um, uh, encourage economic development through AI, through technology on the continent. So um, picking up on what you said there about the untapped potential and the kind of, you know, the kind of commitment to acceleration, but also Shira's comments about, you know, this moment in time being really crucial. I'd like to know, what do you see as um, the biggest opportunities of getting this right? But equally, what are the biggest risks of getting it wrong? So ethics um, has been a big topic um, lately. Ethics, biases, diversity, it has been a major topic in, in AI um, lately. And we haven't seen just one framework yet which works. Um, because Africa still has um, and um, still is an untapped opportunity or an opportunity which is growing right now and has the, the, the potential to become, um, to really drive innovation for, for everybody um, from an applied AI perspective. Perspective. I feel like um, Af 
we have the opportunity to work with international organizations, public, private sectors, communities, to be able to embed ethics at a foundational layer of mm -hmm. all the initiatives that are um, uh, coming out um, um, of Africa and AI. Um, looking at the blockers, I would say sometimes people see Africa as one country, but it's actually a continent with a lot of different countries, a lot of different ecosystems, a lot of different communities. And uh, we need to work with all these um, uh, differences between all these countries and make sure that we not, we not only look at it um, from an international level or just at the level of the continent and the region, but we also look at local ecosystems inside the countries. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, that's really interesting. And I think we're going to come back to that. Um, but I'd like to bring in Ernest now, if that's OK. Um, so Ernest Morvaze, welcome. Um, so um, you're a research scientist at Sunbird AI. Why don't you just tell us a bit about yourself and the work that you're doing there? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thank you for <clears throat> having me here. Uh, it's good to, to have black tech face. You know, sounds good, feels good, good to be here. So yeah, I'm called Ernest Morvaze. Um, currently a research scientist or research director at Sunbird AI. Pretty new firm focused on AI for social good. So previously I, uh, I worked with uh, Google AI in Ghana. I, I did some work with the UN and uh, previous to that, I was a lecturer in Makere here in Uganda. And we started this uh, Makere AI lab that sort of focuses on uh, leveraging AI for, for, for addressing social challenges. <clears throat> So that sort of has been my, uh, my, my personal ecosystem for the last couple of years. And my role has sort of been changing along that line. Uh, yeah. I, mean, I think it's interesting because Shira's talking about the kind of the research and training element. And Kate's been talking about the kind of the big picture, the ecosystem. And I think you very much bring a practitioner sort of perspective to this, you know, someone who's kind of at the coalface doing it, um, you know, um, and I think Sunbird AI is a not-for-profit, is that correct? Yeah, it's a not-for-profit. So it's uh, slightly different from the, the usual, well, maybe the, not the usual, but the, the ordinary AI outfits. So normally AI outfits are looking at uh, maybe working at the edge of research, at the edge of uh, the cutting edge of research and mm. pushing research forward. Sunbird, we try and concentrate on the practicality and the practical aspects of how do you actually take these solutions and deploy them in um, an end-to-end -end manner? And how do you target them for social good? Uh, and I think that's a, a big component. So maybe just to, yeah, that's a big component. It's, it's really interesting that, you know, that, that you're both saying that it's the kind of um, social ethical considerations rather than the kind of um, technological or technical aspects. And in fact, Shira even said the technological aspects may be the easiest and maybe what's making this blossoming possible. Um, so I, I'd like to ask you, Ernest, um, what do you see as the enablers and the blockers to fulfilling the potential of, you know, your vision or your aspirations or, you know, um, what you might be trying to achieve with Sunbed AI? Right. Uh, so the... Um... So, so maybe I'll, I'll recast, uh, yeah, so, so the, the problem or the ecosystem of AI in Africa, I think is quite interesting. So I think a lot of it is targeted towards the social context of, um, of, uh, of our context here in Africa. And this sort of gets coined, you know, the social, social good. So I think that's one enabler that this altruistic nature in which we consume AI in Africa, this sort of solving, social challenges, this comes with a lot of flexibility and a lot of, um, you could say, will, goodwill uh, to do things like scalability, flexibility, and um, the things Shira talked about, like end-to-end -end, uh, deployment. So th that's one big enabler that we, AI is not looked at as in maximizing production, but a big component of it currently is looked at as solving a social purpose. So that's one big enabler. And then, of course, there are less, um, complicated frameworks for ethics, for, uh, for infrastructure. Uh, and these, while there are some disadvantages, these allow for, I think what Shura talked about and what Kay talked about, this idea of end-to-end, -end, that you start with the client, move to the technology, move to the deployment, move to the evaluation, move to impact. And you can do this in a project. Uh, working with other firms, are, you know, it's very hard to do this thing with the whole end-to-end -end system. Normally, you want to do one specific thing. So those are the enablers. 
I think the biggest blockers uh, are sort of, you, as you've mentioned, uh, tie in within this aspect of social good. And so the sociological aspects that accompany the work uh, tend to be the biggest blockers. So I, I think as Shira say, technology is not the most uh, important. So it's relationships, people behind the data, people behind the technology and how do they consume it and all manner of things. In my experience, actually deploying these practical um, solutions, you get hit by this sociological barrier of age, norms, customs, uh, gender, that affect how technology is consumed, deployed, and used. Uh, so areas around that tend to be the biggest blockers. Um, Shira, I can see that you're nodding. Would you like to, would you like to comment on that point? Well, I, I just I, I agree that you know a lot of the times it's you need to have a very good interaction with the people who the tech is supposed to help because the people are at the center of everything. Uh, so, yeah, it's easy to get into technology, the latest algorithms, latest everything, but the people are, are crucial, and ensuring that you're doing it in a respectful way is 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 important. Mm -hmm. And also, sorry to jump in again, not thinking that, you know, tech is the answer to everything, you know. And um, Kate, I, I can see you're nodding too. So I wondered, has this been something that you've also been experiencing in your career? And if so, how did you, you know, how did that affect your practice? How did you adapt to it? Yes, definitely. Um, so when I was mentioning that the innovation is being driven differently from different regions, sometimes in the US, we think that going after the latest, greatest board or latest, greatest algorithms um, is going to revolutionize mm -hmm. the world. But actually, it doesn't mean anything until you apply it to solve a specific problem. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I've noticed is that um, in Africa, we have people like um, Shira students, for example, who apply technology completely differently and in very um, um, surprising ways, like monitoring Kenyan rivers, for example. Same technology that I would give to a developer in, in the US who would do a anti-porch pirate system. Um, these are two different problems, um, very, very far from each other. Um, but one is more surprising than the other because one is actually going to help the environment compared to the other, which is pr pretty much an individualistic and, and grow phone problem. Um, so, um, so yeah, we need to, when we build technology, we need to always remember that we actually build it to improve people's experiences and improve people's lives. Mm -hmm. And that's something we tend to forget because we get too excited by um, the, advan the technological advancements. So that, um, that, that, that makes me wonder, and this is a question to the whole panel. Um, so in your, in your careers and your experience so far of contributing to building Africa's AI system, I wonder whether, I wonder whether you'd share with the audience um, your, your best example of innovation that you've seen, you've seen in, this, in your career. Innovation or good practice, but let's go for innovation. So I'll go in the order in which you spoke. Um, so I'll start with Shira, sort of 30 seconds each. Oh my, that, that's the hardest question. I was hoping you'd be in the reverse <laughs> order. <laughs> so, um, yeah, for me, I think M-Pesa is uh, one of, I mean, if you're just talking technological innovations, I don't know if you're familiar with M-Pesa, which is a mobile money transfer that we use in Kenya. It's, uh, it's uh, I think it's one of the technologies that whenever I think of an, a technological innovation, I think about that because you, it's one of those things, it's high tech, but anybody, everybody uses it and you don't need to teach anybody to use it. So and it has revolutionized finance in Kenya. Everything is easy to pay over the mobile phone. So that is usually what I look at in tech. Yeah, I can jump in. Yeah, yeah. so is that um, Ernest now or? Get. Yeah, I can jump in uh, quickly. Because, yeah, so I think the, the, the one really good one has been some innovations in Uganda with farmers, uh, empowering farmers to collect data for surveillance and sort of rewarding them with these incentive mechanisms. It has been quite impressive, the impact on the farmers, the smaller farmers. So yeah, that has been quite good application of AI. Thank you. And Kate? 
Yeah, I will uh, answer the question from a different perspective. I'll look at it more from an applied AI and applied machine learning standpoint. Um, and um, uh, the, the innovations I've been the most surprised uh, and amazed by lately have been um, pretty much what I've been driven out of the um, academics community in Africa. So I mentioned the system that the uh, Shira students have built to monitor one of the Kenyans river, but I've also seen um, students from Polytechnic School um, in Dakar, Senegal, building autonomous robots to help uh, frontline workers um, uh, deal with the pandemic um, and um, and help administrate um, um, administrate medicine to patients without without with no contacts. So these are the type of innovations that I'm amazed today more than the uh, pure technology bit. <laughs> It's very inspiring, and I think I'm in the wrong continent. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for sharing your, your time and your expertise, and some really great examples and thought-provoking perspectives on the relationship between technology and people and, and the world that we're building together. Um, yeah, thank so you thank for you moderating. Thanks.